All right, good morning. How is everyone? Michael. <laughs> Michael's running around sweating. I'm like, what are you, what are you sweating? He goes, he goes, bro, bro, there's 17 kids back in the youth room. We haven't even dismissed them yet. So that's good news. If you've got high school students, they got some friends back there. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, welcome to church. If this is your first time here, my name is Bronson. I'm one of the leaders here, and I'm excited you're here. Uh, we got any fellas in the house? Any fellas? Let me hear a little. Like, any fellas? Okay. Uh, th- this Tuesday night, I want to invite you. Um, we're we're going to have a night uh, for the men up at our Conway Church. And uh, it's going to be at 6 o'clock. And uh, my, our, our founding pastor, Pastor Rick, texted me this morning. He's like, i got a challenge. Like, he's like, I've got a word in my heart. I want the men to be there. I want to challenge them. I don't know, guys. I don't know how you're wired. I love a challenge. Like, you challenge me to do something or you tell me, hey, I don't know if you've got this in you, but we'll see. I'm like, you're going to find out, right? You know? And so come out. That, that's going to be a good night. And I, I want to invite you to tell you some things that are going on. I, I know as men, so often in, in different seasons of life, we have no idea what we're doing, what we kind of have to act like we do. Come on, fellas, amen on that. And, you know, it's like when, when you're getting married or engaged, it's like, oh my gosh, I've got to ask this question. Is this the right person? All those different things. Then you have kids and you're like, oh my gosh, I've got to raise this kid. And then they get older and they're in high school and they're rebelling and you're like, I've got to discipline this kid, you know, or whatever. And at every season of life, you know, you're retired. You're trying to figure out what that looks like. And I know every person goes through that, but men specifically, I want to talk to you. We're going to set aside a time every Wednesday morning, not this week, but starting next week, uh, where we just get together and we pray. And we seek God together. And we ask for wisdom for our families. We pray over our kids, pray over your businesses. And we're going to start there. Eventually, we'll probably do a study or something. But I want to invite you to come out. It'll be right here in the sanctuary Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. And I'd love for you to come to that. Cool? Okay, let's, let's get to this. Actually, one more bit of announcement. Uh, so, something that's a core belief for myself, for Callie, for our church at large, is that God doesn't just call us to himself, but he also calls us to each other. And so today, some of you guys, who's here just for the catfish? You're like, man, I, I wish you'd really get through this because I'm here for the catfish that's outside. Um, but what we believe is that we're better together. We, we believe that God didn't call us isolated as Christians to live on an island, but to live in a relationship. And so if you're looking for a place to plug in, next week we're having our life group launch. Okay, so there's gonna be over 20 groups, Bible studies, there's recreation groups. I hear Nathan's gonna be playing some volleyball or something like that. Oh yeah, he doesn't just do video work. Uh, but if you can't make it next weekend, there's a Connect tent out there. We'd love to get to know you. We'd love to help you sign up, find a group. So we're kind of giving you two weekends here. But next weekend, we're going to have tables, and we're going to kind of call it open house, where you can walk around the church and, and find a place in it. And so, okay, this week, we're starting in the book of Acts. Everybody say Acts. Uh, we're going to be studying through this over the next 12 weeks, and it's going to be a blast. And we're going to be looking at what made the early church the early church, Right? Like, how did this ragtag group of guys who could not get it together in any of the Gospels all of a sudden do the things that they did? And so we're going to be looking at what God did within the church. And so if you're taking notes, uh, the, the, the book of Acts, it's written by Luke. Ru- Luke also, <laughs> Ruke, uh, both services. Uh, Luke also wrote another book. Does anybody have an idea what that might be called? The Gospel of Luke. That's right. We've got a bunch of geniuses. Okay. Uh, So he he wrote the Gospel of Luke about the life of Jesus and how Jesus lived and his ministry and his life, death, and resurrection. And then he wrote the book of Acts, and he wrote it to a guy named Theophilus. Everybody say Theophilus. Now, Theophilus is, is also an adjective, and I love this. It was definitely a person's name, but it's an adjective that means loved by God. And I just think that's so cool. Like, this is a book that was written to those loved by God. Isn't that cool? And so we get to look and see, okay, how, how are we supposed to live, and how are we supposed to minister and, and have life together? And so what, what we're going to see is we're going to see a honeymoon period. And I think that what happens so often for churches and Christians is we look at the honeymoon period and we're like, we got to get back to the early church, right? Anybody ever said that? My hand is so high. And I actually believe that. But what we miss is that they had this short period 
where it was like everything was going well. They were growing like crazy. 3,000 people were added to the church in one day, and they're meeting in each other's homes, and the Holy Spirit's moving in crazy ways. Y'all, it was pandemonium. Like, it was crazy the things that were happening, and then persecution came, and their leaders started getting killed by people who were threatened by them, and people who were dear to them in the community were murdered. I mean, just think about that. And then there was absolute hypocrisy and lying. And we're going to talk about that out of Acts chapter five. Some crazy stuff happens there. But then the gospel just spreads like crazy. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at what happened in the early church. What can we learn from it? And in this series, we're going to study that nature. What what moved them from being this ragtag group of marginalized, uneducated people to, listen to this, being the most powerful, think, let this settle in, the most powerful movement in the history of the world. We're going to get to track, we're going to get to read. This is the one letter that outlines what happened in this group of people. And as we study, we have to ask ourselves this question, what marked these people? And what does that mean for us? We're going to see revival, healing, works of power, hypocrisy, unspeakable loss, but at the same time, we're going to see unstoppable hope. And so I'm going to give you a thesis, uh, kind of what we're going to work through today. Um, anybody, anybody appreciate it? Y'all like that? You like getting a, okay. I've got a few people like, yes, I'm, I'm into it. She has to raise her hand. That's my wife. Uh, just looking for some affirmation, you know? This is my thesis for this morning. The call for every Christian is to wait for God's timing, witness to God's power, and live in such a way that causes people to ask questions for which the gospel is the answer. Okay? And so we've got Carly here. Carly's going to read our text for this morning. It's a long text, okay? So she's going to read about 20-something verses. And y'all, this is the most important part of the service. When we open God's word and we read it and we listen to it, there's so much power in this. So let's just take a moment to soak this in and see what God has to say for us today. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard speaking his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears him in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we believe that you are the Lord of everything, that you're the creator of heaven and earth. 
God, we thank you that you gave us this book to speak to us. God, we thank you that you gave us Jesus to save us. And God, we thank you that you gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to empower us. And God, we don't want to grieve you in any way. God, we want to hear directly from you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. And then y'all, Carly can sing and read, okay? She got all of, uh, you had to notice all those different things. The Cretans, she got all of it. Way to go, Carly. And her Bible weighs 10 pounds, okay? Um, uh, okay, so before we get into the text, I, I, I've got a question. Where are my crazy, like, package delivery trackers at? Come on, you're like a psychopath. Where, where, where are you at? Come on, raise your hands proud. Like, okay, now here's the true test. And there, there are wrong answers, there is, there's a correct answer. What app allows you to track the truck? What's, you, what's shop? You can track any truck? FedEx? Let's meet. After church, down here at the altar, we're, we're gonna have some time. I just learned something. There's y'all crazier than me, one. <laughs> but two, I got an app I got to download. How much does it cost? Free. <sighs> God, we just thank you for this morning. And <laughs> yeah. Okay. Man, I just got to take that in. I'm so excited. Okay. So for me, I, I use the UPS tr app. I, I didn't know about this other one. And, and I will track the truck, right? Like, I'll find out what neighborhood it is. I know where my UPS driver goes to lunch every day, okay? I know where he stops. Every day, he stops in the same place. And so I, I'm, like, crazy tracking the packages. I've had them, you know, not even knock on my door before. Anybody else had that? Like, you're like, okay, I'm going to come, you know, home from work during these periods. I'm going to make sure I get this package so I can sign for it. All of a sudden it says, couldn't, could not deliver. And it's like, oh, heck no, right? Jump in my car. I have tracked the driver down twice, like four or five streets away. And I've said, excuse me, I think you have something that belongs to me. And he's like, oh my gosh. She's like, yeah, yeah. I, I knocked on your door. I'm like, no, you didn't. You know, I was there the whole time. I hadn't used the bathroom in three hours, you know. <laughs> So why, why do I do this? One, it's, it's because I, I hate waiting, right? Like, really, that's it. I, I hate waiting. I'm impatient, uh, and it's kind of fun. It's like a game, right? Um, I'm impatient. And, and, and what strikes me so much in this text, just think about that for those of you who are impatient. Jesus says, I'm going to send you a gift, and, and you need to wait. And he gives no timeline. Think about that. The first commandment he gives them when he departs is he says, I want you to wait for the gift that's coming. Y'all, that would have driven me crazy. Now, now, here's what we know. It was about 10 days because at the festival of Pentecost, and gosh, there's a ton here. Uh, I'm looking at the clock. Do I have time? Um, so basically, what the festival of Pentecost was, it was originally the festival of first fruits. And so this was a time when they came in, they brought the first fruits of the harvest. But eventually through history, it became a time where they commemorated uh, Moses' meeting with God face-to-face -face and getting the Ten Commandments. So they were remembering a time when, when God and man met and they got a word from God. And it's beautiful here that at Pentecost, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's look. Acts 1 verse 4. Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem, but what? Wait. So why did they have to wait? I'll answer the question with another question. How did a group of 120 uneducated, marginalized people with virtually no power, living under Roman occupation, which was the greatest empire the world had ever seen, come to become the dominant group of people on the planet within 200 years. How did this group of people who had no power come to become the most powerful group of people on the planet? Let's drive this deeper. Let's look at some three failures, like utter failures of the disciples, right? So Jesus does a teaching in Matthew 20 where he says the, the greatest will be the least and the least will be the what? 
servants will be the greatest in God's kingdom. And two of the disciples go to their mom and they're saying, yeah, Jesus, servants will be great. That sounds good. Mom, can you go to Jesus and ask him if we can sit on your right and on your left when the kingdom comes, right? So their mom, just imagine this. It's so embarrassing. It's like your mom going to your boss and saying like, can you, my, my boy deserves a promotion. Literally, that's what happened. And it's like, Jesus, will you let my son sit on your right and your left? And he says, that's not for me to decide, but you're totally missing. I can't imagine. Like, Jesus was patient. I would have been so exasperated. I'm like, just, just get out of here. Like, you're not getting it, okay? But he has grace. He doesn't do that. Then we have, have Peter. We'll look at two failures of Peter. He cuts a guy's ear off, right? Jesus is like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, attacking this guy. <laughs> then after Christ told Peter, you're going to deny me three times, what does Peter do? He denies him three times. These men went from a bunch of fumbling fools, right? Just falling all over themselves, totally missing it, to leading with authority and power and carrying a message and a movement we're still a part of today. So the question we have to ask is what changed in them? They received power. They received true power. Everybody say true power like the world had never seen, the power of the Holy Spirit. They preached with power. They healed the sick and they pioneered the greatest movement the world has ever seen, the church. What's totally different about this power from any other type of power in the world is it had absolutely nothing to do with them. They had this realization that their power was not about them, but it was about God's glory. We're, we're going to study this in the coming weeks, but if you go look at healings, like, yo, if I healed somebody, I'd be like, you know, like, high kick, Chris, oh, high kick. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not going to split my pants, but I would be pumped, right? I'd be so, but here's what they said. What happened in you happened for the glory of Christ so that you would, your ears would be open to hear the gospel. God healed you so that God could save you. They had this this unbelievable lens that it was not about their glory, but it was about God's glory. But think about our world. When people get power, they get puffed up, they get prideful, and they get drunk on their own power. You don't often see someone get tons of power within our world who doesn't become prideful and puffed up. They got humbled and they got sobered. They didn't get drunk on their power. They were like, look at God's greatness and God's glory. It transformed them, and it made them selfless. And they had to yield to God. Okay, I've got a sign here. You guys know what this is? A lot of people know in this room. A lot of people in Little Rock have no idea. <laughs> so just in case, I know all of you guys know it, but just in case, we're, we're going to go through it. When you have one of these signs, what do you have to do? Stop. Who are you yielding to? Okay, so, so what that means, right, is that you have to watch the movements of the other person and you have to base what you do based on what they do, right? And so what God has called us to do is to base our movements on yielding to his spirit. So we're watching eagerly to see what is God doing and that's directing our action. And this is what the early church was absolutely built on. They had to wait for the spirit and the power that would come. And then they acted accordingly. We're going to see two things in this text. They had to wait, and the power they got was not about them. Okay, so number one, we're going to have three points here. Number one, we are all called to wait for God's timing. Everybody say timing. Acts 1, verse 4, second half of it. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me talk about. Um, my, my first job at New Life Church, as some of you guys know if you've been around for a while, is I was a, a master of the custodial arts. That was my, my, my job title. Uh, I, I'd actually, I'd been a worship leader uh, up north, up in Ohio at a church, and honestly, guys, it's a long story, but I just felt called to Arkansas, and I was like, you guys got any jobs? Actually, Callie was the secretary at the time, and Callie was like, I mean, I think we're hiring a maintenance guy. Can you do maintenance? And I was like, I'm incredible at maintenance. <laughs> I puffed up my resume a little bit. I was terrible, 
I'm the worst maintenance guy in the history of the world. Yeah, there's still scars on that building from the awful things that I tried to do to it, right? Just trying to fix things. Um, and, and in this season, I wonder if anybody can relate to this. At first, it was great. Like, I had a job, and I was excited, and I was around something. But then at some point, I started saying, God, you've called me to more than just this, right? Like, God, there's things you've put in my heart. Like, I believe you called me to pastor a church, but I'm just scrubbing the floors of a church. And, y'all, I remember every week I had to go through with an auto scrubber, sometimes twice a week. And this building is like 50,000 square feet. It's huge. And I had to auto scrub all the polished surfaces, which was the entire church. And so I'd have time to just sit there and wrestle with God and pray. And so many things that have come to define our ministry happened while I was pushing that sinking auto scrubber. And, And I remember one day I was particularly struggling. And we had our, insur- our internship that was meeting uh, in, the, in the foyer at the time. And I could kind of hear them laughing. They're joking around and pushing my auto scrubber. God, what am I doing? You know, what do you have for me? And one of the kids gets a piece of gum, unwraps it, pops it in his mouth, twists up the wrapper, and throws it in front of the auto scrubber. And goes, hey, you missed a spot. And I was just melting down inside, you know? Like, this was one of my life group guys. I still remember his name. I'm not going to say it. I love him. But I was so angry. And I'm like, if you knew the things God had planned for me, you'd never disrespect me like that. You know, all my pride is just rushing to the surface, you know? And and I remember in that moment, the Holy Spirit hit me with something that I, I, I take with me in every season of my life, is... God hit me with, if if I've called you to do this for another 10 years, will you do it? Will you wait for my timing? And I just remember it was in that moment where it was a a real submission for me where it was like, God, yes. Like, if this is what you have for me to do. And and here's what I've learned. You know, some of you guys, you're going through seasons of life right now, and you don't feel like you're where you're supposed to be. You're in a job where you feel like, man, I should be moving up faster than what I'm moving up. Or God, what am I doing here? What am I doing in Little Rock? I thought you called me to go somewhere else. And what I found to be true is that we do not get to determine the seasons. God determines the seasons, right? Just like right now, we didn't determine it was going to (laughs) rain. We're doing a big fish fry, right? God determines these things. And for us, we have to find our assignment and wait patiently within them. So my question for you is what are you waiting for? What are you believing for? What are the things that you've been praying for for years that maybe you haven't seen come to pass yet? And here's what I want to tell you. God is faithful even when sometimes the answer is no. It's easy to have faith with the yeses. Even the yeses where it's like, man, I prayed for a long time and eventually God came through. But what we're going to see is like, particularly, you look at the martyrdom of Stephen. He was a major leader in the church. Like, I'm not comparing myself, but let's just imagine like Pastor Blake, who was up here earlier. Let's imagine our world goes crazy and he gets taken in by the authorities and he gets stoned to death. I, I would be saying, God, you're the God who raises the death to life. You can raise people who are in the grave back to living. And we're praying that you would resurrect Blake. I have to believe in the early church when this persecution was happening. There were people praying audacious prayers like that. And y'all, sometimes God does it. Like God does the miraculous. We're going to see that all throughout this. But sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes the answer is no. But y'all, this is the Christian hope. This is what we have to remember. It talks about, in the, in the first part, it says, the, the angels come, verse 11 of chapter 1. It says, men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken away from you in heaven. But look, someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Y'all, what we believe, and this is going to sound crazy to some of you guys, but I'm telling you, it's what the Bible says and it's what I believe to be true, is that one day, in the same way that Jesus left, Jesus will return. And he'll return with restoration in his hands. And what we're going to see is all that God intended for us to be and all that God intended for the earth to be is going to come to pass. And he's going to bring the new heavens and a new earth and he's going to renew the world. And we will reign as kings and princes with God in this paradise. This is the hope. 
When we talk about heaven, biblically, that is the hope of heaven. It's not that we're going to wear diapers and like float on clouds, right? It's that there will be a very physical reign and kingdom of Jesus. Y'all, this is what we're working towards. And everything that we build in his name works towards that. That is good news. And that is the hope of the gospel. Can I get an amen? So it makes it easier to wait on God's timing in light of God's promise. Number one, we're called to wait for God's timing. Number two, we're called to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse six, chapter one. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? A a quick aside here. So what, what they're saying is, right now we're under Roman occupation. We are no longer an autonomous people. We are ruled by someone else. It would be like, and I've used this before, but if, if you weren't here for this, it would be like as if Russia came and invaded the United States of America and were like saying, you're all going to be Russians now, <laughs> right? And you know how Americans are. That would be tough to pull off. We'd be like, oh, you're going to have to kill us, you know? That's how the Jewish people were. And what they were saying is, God, when are, Christ, when are you going to become king? Is this now? You're going to become the king, and you're going to restore us, and you're going to drive Rome out, and we're going to see the glory of Israel returned? That's what they're asking. Now look at what he says in verse 7. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. He's saying at some point God's going to restore, but maybe not the way that you think. And they're not for you to know. Verse 8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Everyone say witnesses. Witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, I'm going to set this up and we're going to teach through it. So, in chapter 2, we see where it talks about how there were people coming in and they heard this loud sound and rushing wind and people rushed to the house. Like, I I just want to kind of enter the text here and and think about this. Imagine, this is probably about 120 people. Imagine all of a sudden this place starts shaking, right? And there sounds like a stinking tornado, all right? And all of us are like, oh my gosh, something's happening, (laughs) you know? And all of a sudden there's fire that descends from heaven and we get hit and filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden we all start speaking in languages we do not know. We don't understand. It would be like, okay, what they say is they say you're Galilean. So Galilean swallowed their sounds, which made it really hard for them to speak other dialects. And what was blowing their mind is that the Galileans were speaking other languages in perfect dialect. So what was happening is all of us would be declaring the goodness of God and things that had happened and people were rushing around. So what happened at Pentecost is people that were dispersed. It was called the diaspora. These were uh, nationally Jewish people who'd been dispersed through many exiles in the Old Testament. And they were living all throughout the known world. They would journey in and they would come to Jerusalem to worship. And so all of these people, guess what? Spoke lots of different languages, right? Because they'd been dispersed for hundreds of years. And so the miracle that's happening here is these people rush in and they're hearing the gospel and the good news of God in all these other languages. Isn't that crazy? And so the first act of the Holy Spirit was to use people to spread the gospel. Think about that. It was to use the Christians to edify others and to tell of God's glory. I've got to be really careful with this. I I don't feel like I aced this in first service. (laughs) There's a part of, and this is like one 30-minute sermon. I can't possibly get into all the different ways that the Holy Spirit moves and acts. Um, But what I've observed through the years is often a lot of people that I get around that are are the most spirit-filled. So, For context, I grew up Presbyterian, which is probably like, no offense for any Presbyterians, we're probably like the least spirit-filled, you know, cessationists, they don't believe in the gifts of the spirit. So like when I grew up, like somebody raising their hand, I remember the first time somebody raised their hand in church, they had cancer. And I remember in worship them like fighting just to like, you know, like God, I'm going to raise, says I should raise hands, I'm going to do it. And everybody was like, Bo, you know, like. But as I got saved and I got around different denominations, when I started hearing about the movements of the Spirit, it was amazing, and I've seen incredible things. But a lot of times, 
the people that I've seen who are the most focused on the movements of the Spirit and being Spirit-filled, a lot of times what I found they're talking about is self-expression. And gosh, guys, there is moments like we're in worship, like we're expressive. Like I want this room to shake when we're in worship. You know what I'm saying? Like I want us to get a little rowdy. I'll, I'll take a passionate church over a polished church any day of the week, right? Um, but at the same time, this is the tension within the scripture is there has to be order to the service and we have to be aware of unbelievers and people who are in here. And so what we have to watch out for, we've always said something from the beginning of New Life Church, which is like, we want you to get wild in worship, glorifying God. The only thing we ask is that you not draw attention to yourself. And, and what I've seen through the years is I've seen times where things have gotten not just rowdy, but it's like, this is getting like, not just right, it's like getting out of control, you know? And I don't know if I'm expressing this super well, but what we have to watch out for, and we have to ask the question, are, are we seeking to express ourselves or are we seeking to glorify God and edify others? The gifts of the Spirit exist to glorify God and to edify others. Uh, let, let's, let's jump into this. So. Well, the first thing we see happen when the Spirit of God filled the believers is that they use supernatural gifts for the glory of God and the betterment of the people around them. The primary work of the Holy Spirit, if you're taking notes, is to bring us in alignment with God's truth and to bring us into alignment with God's purposes. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, which I had to learn as, good, as a good Presbyterian boy. Number one, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let's just like take that in. That's our chief goal, is to glorify God and enjoy him. But listen, if the devil cannot get you to deny Christ, he'll try to get you to exalt yourself. He'll try to get you to exalt your vision over his vision. Y'all, we see this in churches, right? Y'all, we have to be careful as a church. It's like, God, is this about us? Is this about New Life Church? Or is this about you and your glory? And we're a small part of what you've been doing. Well, we have to look as individuals and say, man, am I using my faith the way that God's built me up to glorify him and edify others? Or am I using those gifts to exalt myself? So we see this. Let's look really quickly, and I'm over time, but I'm going to keep going, even if you don't want me to. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, some of you guys are like, catfish. Um, Luke 4. So if you're familiar, if you're not familiar, there's the temptation of Jesus in the desert, which is where Jesus goes and he fasts for 40 days, 40 nights. He has no food, no water. And at the end of that time, he's hungry, the Bible says, which that sounds good, right? Uh, and the devil comes to him and says, if you are who you say you are, turn these stones into bread. What's he trying to get him to do? He's trying to get him to exalt himself to get outside of God's timing and to fulfill his own needs, right? The next thing he says, he says, if you'll worship me, I'll make you the name that's above every other name on earth. I'll give you all authority, all glory. All you have to do is f fall down and worship me. What's he trying to tempt him to do? He's trying to get him to exalt himself and to get in front of God's timing. The last thing he says is says, I'm gonna take you. He takes him to the top of the temple. And he says, if you throw yourself out, well, if you throw yourself off the temple, if you're truly the son of God, the angels will come down from heaven and they'll protect you because the word says that he won't let your foot hit a stone. And he says, get away from me, leave. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna glorify God. And then it says, the next sentence, it says that he walked into Galilee, interesting, in the spirit and in power. And what he does is he unrolls the scroll of Isaiah. He goes into the temple, he unrolls the scroll, and he reads from it. And here's what it says. Isaiah 4, or sorry, Luke 4, 18 and 19. This is the mission statement of Jesus. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Everything in what Jesus was saying, him walking in power, was to set others free and to build others up. I love this quote. God, we pray for that child. I pray it's not mine. In Jesus' name. 
John Dixon said this. He says, humility is about redirecting your powers. Everybody say powers. powers. Think for a second. What powers do you have? <laughs> Not like superpowers or whatever. What influence do you have? What gifting do you have? Humility is about redirecting your powers, whether physical, intellectual, financial, structural, I'll add in spiritual, for the sake of others. The Holy Spirit enables us to live in a way that most glorifies God and it edifies other people. So here's my question for you. If we as a church are going to walk in the power and the authority of the early church, what do we have to do? Glorify God and serve and edify others. But y'all, this goes directly against the culture of the world that we live in. I'm going to give you a little bit of philosophy here. So uh, there's something called our primary desire, desires. The technical philosophy is first order desires, but it gets really difficult to say that a bunch of times. So I'm going to say primary desires. And then we have secondary desires, which is second order desires. Okay. So if you're starving, how many of us in here are like, man, I want a salad, you know? Can't wait to get to Zaza, get a salad, right? No, you're going to go to Zaza, and you're going to get the pizza, and you're going to get the wings, because they're incredible, right? Come on, let's be honest. If you're starving, are you laying around fantasizing about a salad? Are you laying around fantasizing about burgers and fries, right? Now, what we know, second order desires, is we want to be healthy. We want to feel not groggy and gross the next day. And so we should eat the salad. Right? But often our first order desires take precedent. Okay, now what I'm not saying is like some of you guys, we're gonna leave here, we're literally about to eat fried catfish, okay? So I'm not heaping judgment on you. But what I'm saying is, is that we know in order to be healthy, that initial desire is not the healthiest desire. There's something underneath it that helps us to become healthy. Okay, what's the point of this? True freedom is not doing whatever we want, right? That's what the world calls freedom. That's what secularism says, live however you want, do whatever you want, find what's inside of yourself and self-actualize it. But what the Spirit says is that we have to subject our flesh, that's our first order desires, under the control of the Spirit so that we can have our second order desires, so that we can have the results we want to have. Now what the enemy is gonna try to get us to do within the community of faith is focus on our own needs. First order desire. But the work of the Spirit humbles us and helps us seek health for ourselves and the fulfillment of the needs of others. Does that make sense? I got, I got a quote, and then we're going to close. Uh, John Tyson said this. He says, we live in a world that has indulgence fatigue. Think about that. We're actually sick of seeing people live for sex, money, and power in a constant cycle of burnout. Instead of being driven by sex, money, and power, we must be driven by faithfulness, generosity, and servanthood. We still enjoy the great gift of God that's human sexuality, but we do it in, fa in a faithful covenantal framework that's within marriage. We still experience the goodness of God that's granted through wealth. Well, there's nothing wrong with making money, right? But we do it with a spirit of generosity and sharing. We still occupy positions of influence, but we don't use that power to build our own kingdoms. We do it to serve others in the spirit of Christ. Last point. We're called to live in such a way that it causes people to ask questions for which the gospel is the answer. Acts 2.12. We're closing with this. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. There was something happening that caused people to ask questions. It says in 1 Peter, it says, be ready to give an answer for the hope you have. But here's the problem. The problem comes when we're living in such a way that doesn't cause people to ask questions about our hope. When we're living in such a way where people aren't saying, man, like you're different, like you're generous. Like, you, you love your wife well. You love your family well. You're committed. You're serving other people. People will ask, I'm telling you, if we live like that, the world around us will ask us, why are you doing what you're doing? I've had people ask me, why are you in ministry? 
go into business, right? Now listen, this is not the pinnacle. My job is literally to equip you and to encourage you to go out and to do the ministry. It says that the pastor's job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so my question for you all, for us to be effective as a church, this is not the pinnacle of church. Now this is where we gather for the glorification of God and the edification of each other, right? That means we worship and we encourage each other. But it's when we go out Monday through Saturday that we live missionally and we we act in our workplaces in a way that makes people say, like, you're different. Like, what's going on in you? And so how did Christ live? I promise it. Three false closes in. We're almost there. I got one more after this one. We've got to spend time with Christ, become like Christ, and then ask what would Christ do if he were me in my shoes? Philippians 2, 5 and 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not consider equality with God something that he could cling to or grasp. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, was born as a human being, and when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. God's called us to humility and to servanthood. And if we do that, we'll walk in power. Now, what did the enemy promise Christ in the temptation? He said, if you worship me, you'll have authority and glory and all the kingdom of the earth will be beneath you. Look at verse nine. Therefore, because he lived like this, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue can declare that Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Here here it is. And I I grappled with this all week. There is something about Christ. Our, Our world looks like this. It's top down, Right? Those who have power and strength and all those things dominate those who are weak. But the kingdom of Jesus turns that on its head. Those that serve, those that admit their weakness, those who admit that they need help are the people who become strong and powerful. And so I wanna ask you a series of questions. Um, Number one, where is it that you most most struggle to wait for God? It could be a legitimate struggle, listen. I know some of your stories. And I know enough about life to know that some of you guys, you've been fighting battles for a long time. You've been praying prayers for a long time. For people who are lost, people who are hurting, hurts in you that God would heal those things. All kinds of struggles. Where do you most struggle to wait for God's timing? Number two, what does power mean to you? Does it mean laying your life down and becoming like Christ? Or does it mean building yourself up? And number three, are you living your life in a way? Christians, listen, if you're not a Jesus follower in here, you ignore this part, we'll come to this later. But Jesus followers, are you living your life in such a way that makes people ask questions for which the gospel of Jesus is the answer? So what is the gospel? We're gonna close right here. The gospel is that God created us. He breathed life into our lungs. That we rebelled and we sought our own interests. And from that moment, God sought to redeem us and to bring us back into our purpose. Christ came and lived a life none of us could ever live. He lived a perfect life, perfectly obedient, perfectly yielding to the Spirit of God. And he died a death that a criminal deserves. He died a death the Bible says that we deserve. And while we were enemies of God, while we were at our worst, Christ was at at his best and he was nailed to a cross for me and for you. And that he rose again on the third day so that we could have a relationship with our creator and we could come to know the relationship that would define us, that we could become fully human. Because when we sin, it degenerates us. It lessens us as humans. But when we walk in relationship with God, we become all that God's called us to be. And like we talked about earlier, once you're a Christian, then we get to work towards the kingdom of God 
that will one day come where we reign with Christ. And so I've got two questions. We're gonna close. We're gonna go into a time of response. What's God speaking to you? And if he's speaking, what are you gonna do about it?